was a real natural smile. <laughs> and we are live. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another season and episode of Earth is Our Witness, a new platform Art and I started uh, a year back when we invite photographers from all around the world to share interesting stories, photography with the purpose that can, you know, just change our lives. Today is a really, really special guest. Um, and I'll tell you special, I say this all the time because everyone is special for a different reason, but today I'll tell you why our guest is special. Before we introduce the guest and today's topic, let me welcome you all. And also let me welcome my good friend and artist in residence, Art Wolf. Art, how are you? I'm excellent. I spent the whole day in my garden. It was a beautiful late uh, October day, and now I'm ready to sit and be entertained by my good friend, James. Great. Do you ever sit still, Art? I got to ask you, or do you, are you always doing something? I'm always got something to do. I'm not, okay. a, a, I, I think James and I have a lot in common in that. We're very productive. We're always working on projects and yeah, we're fit as a fiddle and full of beans. Great, great. So let's, let's talk about today's guest, James Baylog. Uh, James is not just any photographer and fantastic photographer and also a filmmaker, also a scientist not just any filmmaker, he has made multiple films. Uh, the one that I remember what I watched about a couple of years back is called Chasing Eyes. That was shortlisted for the Oscars a few years back. So that's, that's the caliber of um, class we're talking about here. Chasing Eyes, I watched on Netflix. If you haven't, please watch that. It's absolutely epic. And James has come up uh, two years back with a new uh, film called The Human Element. And what's new to that is now he's come up with a new book called The Human Element that is available as a new pre-order on Amazon Prime. It ships next week. And today, James is gonna talk, talk about The Human Element, what it is, and uh, share a few images and some stories. Let me read out before we start, and before I welcome uh, James officially, let me read out what The Human Element is. Human Element, a magnus, magnum opus on the human impact on our planet, from animal extinction to catastrophic wildfires, from global warming to glacier melts, from historic floods to ferocious storms. James Baylock presents four decades of his research and photography in this environmental call to arms. Please welcome photographer, scientist, filmmaker, James Baylock joining us from hotel room in Ithaca, New York. Good evening, thank you. I, I wish they hadn't talked about research in that little blurb that Rizzoli wrote. I don't think of it as research. It's it's really just my reaction to the world as a, as a human being, uh, as a photographer, as somebody concerned and experiencing what's happening in the world. But yeah, I've been uh, looking at the intersection of people and the rest of the natural environment for 40 years. Um, I used to think of there being two states of being. One was humanity, one was people, and I was looking at the boundary or the collision between the two. I no longer think that. I now think of all of us being on a continuum, that humanity is in a continuum with earth, air, fire, water, plants, and animals. We're all wound up in one big biological and natural system. It's fantastic. And you're joining us from Ithaca, New York. What a place, from a hotel room, that too. Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's a charming thing here. There's the makeup mirror in the bathroom there, and there's the shower over there, and the bed is over there. But it was the best light I could find in this crazy room. I'm I'm actually here to do some uh, some business at Cornell. Uh, they they made me a, a, a professor at large a couple of years ago, and we had some things to work through. And my uh, daughter and son-in-law live here in Ithaca. He teaches at Cornell as well. And uh, they just had uh, my first little granddaughter five weeks ago. So I wanted to come and squeeze the little baby granddaughter. So Oh, we, wow. Yeah. We're a busy man. Okay, great. Yeah. We, grandfather. I never never thought that that word would get attached to me. But there it is. I kind of like it. It's cool. So should I call you James or Grandpa? Pops. Pops. Okay. <laughs> Or Grando, we're, we're, my, my daughter is calling me Grando right now. Grando, okay. I think I, might have met, I think I met your daughter when we were down in Maeda on the Yucatan Peninsula years yeah. and years ago. Would she have been there, right? She would have been there. You have a very good memory, Arthur, for, for you know, we're old guys. We can't remember more than a month ago, but you're doing well. 
<laughs> I'm not old, I'm super young. But anyway, with that, should we get started? Uh, audience, I'd love to, you know, for you to see the images and don't forget to ask questions. And I'll try to uh, take up some of your questions towards the end of the conversation. Jane, are you ready? All right, here we go. Um, okay. Sharing. Do we it's see? Let's see yep. here. Uh, there we go. All right. Well, that's the cover, cover of the book, of course. Uh, it's a very large, very heavy book, 20 pound book, pictures by the pound. And um, you'll see that picture come up a few frames in, but uh, go right ahead, please. Next. One sec. Yeah, there might be a five second delay, but yeah. Yeah, so, so these pictures are not in chronological order. They're sort of uh, loosely grouped by theme. Uh, this image is from a series I did between 1998 and 2004. I was doing portraits of America's largest, oldest, strongest trees. And this was a, uh, a portrait of what was at the time the sixth largest organism in the world, the sixth largest single living organism. Um, it became the fifth after another tree got burned down in a fire. But uh, nevertheless, it's a sequoia in the foothills of the Sierra Nevada uh, that goes by the name of stag, this particular tree. Uh, this is a composite of 450 frames that I shot while repelling through the forest. Uh, if you look really, really hard, you can see a little figure in orange at the top. Uh, against the sky, and you can see him reappear way down below. That's my one of my tree raking buddies, uh, Billy Ellison. And, uh, uh, you know, the whole objective here, to me, as a photographer, was to try and do something that was fresh and new. Um, you know, I had done the same pictures that we've all done, where you stand at the base of a sequoia or a redwood, and you look up, and you go, oh, isn't that wonderful? But I wanted to get a sense of the individuality and character of the tree. And uh, so after a couple of years worth of experimentation with repelling, uh, climbing the trees and repelling through the forest, my rigging friends uh, from uh, California and I figured out how to string, string a rope from treetop to treetop, get me out on that rope and then have me drop down to the ground repelling through thin air as I went. And so I'm photographing the tree in pieces as I go down. Uh, and then we stitched it back together on the computer. Now, 20 years ago, this was incredibly hard to do. I mean, it took us two weeks to do the initial assembly because we had to go through my 450 frames and pick the right ones and, and uh, arrange them so that you could see the tree. Uh, it was exciting to watch the tree emerge. Uh, because as I'm repelling, I don't see the tree. I'm just seeing, you know, uh, a little bit above where I am and a little bit below because the thing is so huge in front of me. So I don't get to experience the tree as a, as a character until we put the whole thing together. Uh, and this was the first time that the human eye has seen um, this tree in, in sort of um, portrait form, if, if you will. Mm -hmm essentially a portrait of the tree, uh, a, a, a view that you can't see from the ground. Uh, this, is, this approach has subsequently been copied by others, but uh, uh, it, was, uh, it was a pretty lively adventure when, when we learned how to do these things the first time. And I, and I worked in this vein for several years. Uh, and you know, uh, James, you let know. me jump in here because I think this epitomizes who you are and how your brain works. Because in earlier works, you took animals and you put them in front of white sheets. You always have kind of been leading the forefront of creative ideas on how to portray um, commonly seen subjects. And I think this, this shot of this ancient tree just is the perfect example of that. Well, thank you. I'm flattered, Art. I, I appreciate that. And, and that, in fact, is what I've tried to do. Uh, you know, I'm still perfectly happy photographing uh, uh, easier subjects in easier ways. But the thing that's really animated me personally and individually when I get these ideas in my head for these different series of pictures, uh, the thing that animates me is, damn it, Baylog, find something new, you know, find a fresh approach to it. And uh, that's what keeps me going for sure. 
Uh, there's a certain amount of self-flagellation connected with that. It's, uh, it's not so simple as you know, uh, whipping yourself into some new vision uh, every so often, but uh, it makes it all worthwhile. So it really does. Wonderful. Okay. Go ahead, next. Yep. Um, so just so we're all on the same page, um, the, the title of the book that, I, that I've just published is, is The Human Element, A Time Capsule from the Anthropocene, okay? And I chose those subtitle words very, very carefully, A Time Capsule from the Anthropocene. So in my heart, in my mind, in my camera eye, I feel like I've captured a story about what's going on in our time right now. Uh, and I intend that that's a story that gets passed to those of us here alive, living on the earth right now. But I also hope and dream that it will be looked at by people many, many decades, if not centuries in the future, because the world is changing in a very, very dramatic way as a consequence of the human impact on the rest of the, the environment. And so I want, to, um, I want to hold this. I'm trying to encapsulate all of these changes going on in this book, in these photographs, have this be an historic record, a time capsule. It's not you know, in the cornerstone of a, the local courthouse, it's in this book and here it is, you know, put it on the waves of time so that those people in the future can look back at us and say, my God, what were they doing? What were they thinking of? What was happening back then? Was anybody paying attention? And in a, in a way, the reason why all that sensibility matters is because of this term, the Anthropocene. For those of you who don't know, that's the, um, the term that's being used in contemporary science to describe the idea that uh, uh, people, have become an essential element of the, of the natural system. And we are so, our, our, our impact, our power, the force of our um, population multiplied by our desire for affluence and need to survive and our technology and all those things wrapped together, that all those things put together are changing the basic nature of nature. We are changing the nature of nature and thus this term Anthropocene to describe this epoch of time that we're living in now. Science used to call this period of time the Holocene or modern time. Uh, that was the term that was used once the, uh, ice, the ice sheets receded from the Northern hemisphere. Uh, but now this, the new idea is that we're in the Anthropocene. So this is a time capsule from the Anthropocene, our part of the Anthropocene to push forward. And I started with this picture to launch the Anthropocene idea because so much of what the epoch is about is summarized in this picture. Agriculture has had a profound impact on the character of the landscape, of plant life, of animal life for the past 10,000 years since, approximately since agriculture was invented. And then as we know, um, the burning of fossil fuels has, is having a radical impact on the character of the atmosphere, the chemistry of the atmosphere, and therefore the behavior of the atmosphere, the behavior of the weather, the behavior of the climate. And the climate, let's not forget, is a summation of a lot of weather events over time. So all of that, as I see it, is wrapped up in this picture. And I somewhat, somewhat uh, uh, not sarcastically, but ironically, refer to this picture as the Norman Rockwell picture. This looks like a happy farm, farmland in uh, Pennsylvania, but hiding right behind that, that uh, pleasant surface is an awful lot of story. And that's a coal-fired power plant, let me not forget. Uh, my grandfather died uh, working in a coal mine about 10 miles away from this uh, power plant. Wow. Yeah. What a story and what an image. I mean, you're right. It, there's so much depth to this image. It's amazing. Definitely has that Rockwell uh, Americana. Yeah. yeah, everything is sweet Americana, but uh, there's darkness within. Um, and, um, you know, speaking of burning things, well, of course, uh, 
as a consequence of burning fossil fuels, uh, we're changing the way heat uh, moves in the atmosphere and moisture moves in the atmosphere. And we wind up with uh, fires happening in a way that fires never happened before. Um, this fire happens to be in the Northwest Territories in Canada. Um, I should say that um, I worked on the fire series between 2014 and 26, it was 2014, 15, and 16 during those summers. And um, a lot of it was about shooting material that wound up in the human element film, but I was still able every once in a while to actually do some, uh, some uh, still photography. And, and I just found the fires to be uh, incredibly engaging, interesting, powerful, you know, and just spectacular to work with. Uh, I got trained as a wildland firefighter. My whole team did, all my assistants did. We went to fire school. We had all the Nomex clothing and heavy boots and helmets and all that stuff so that we had some concept of how not to get killed out there because it's, okay. it's really, really dangerous work. Um, but it was just amazing. The science also of fire is fantastic because it's a, uh, the, the science of how things burn is an integration of the fuels, of the weather, of the climate, of the topography, of uh, you know how the wind is blowing in any given moment, how people are responding. And then of course, there's the whole question of how does uh, humanity manage this incredible force? Um, so the, the human element book and film is really looking at earth, air, fire, and water uh, in the context of the human touch. Uh, a lot of us, I think, have heard the term plate tectonics. Sorry, I'm rambling here a little bit. My no, brain go ahead, go ahead. This is good. Uh, uh, I'm going to just excuse myself for one split second. I need to bring some lights up in this room and just keep talking. I'll be right back in one sec. One second. All right. Um, a lot of us have heard the term plate tectonics to describe in the from an earth science standpoint that, that uh, the continents move around and sm rocks smash into rocks and, and mountains get thrust up and volcanoes happen, and earthquakes happen and all that. Well, I've come to think of humanity as a tectonic force. And, it, and in this book, I coined the term human tectonics to, hmm. to denote that, that notion. Uh, wow. Go ahead, next one. You know, can I respond to this image? I'm also working on a book called Fire and Ice, and the and it's to do with a lot of volcanic activity, but also fires. I think this is a extraordinarily beautiful image. Um, it's just got that power, and uh, I love the image. But boy, it's a, a dangerous beauty, and yeah, anybody living in the Northwest is experiencing fires now like never before. So I think it's just something that's extraordinarily beautiful and extraordinarily awful to look at at the same yeah. time. It, it's, it's a, as you know, Art, it's a subject that you can never run out of new ideas, you know, about what to do, where to go, how to photograph it. I could have easily been shooting another five years on this and never run out of uh, uh, fresh things, but, you know, I had to stop, the funding ran out and, you know, we had to get the film done, et cetera. Well, so, and in fact, just a couple of years ago, you were uh, nearly uh, burned out of your home. Yeah, well, that was actually 11 years ago. Uh, yeah, we were almost burned out of our home in the foothills of the Rockies outside Boulder, uh, Colorado. And that was a gripping day. And that was kind of the beginning of the events that led me to go chasing fires uh, as part of the series. Yeah. It's a beautiful image, hauntingly beautiful. Next. Wow. And, uh, this next shot is actually the cover of the book. The, the cover is a crop of this, this shot. Uh, and it was, it's just explosive when the, when the, when the heat uh, hits these, the, the certain kind of vegetation, it just explodes. Uh, the intensity of these events is, it just kind of, gets into your reptile brain, you know, you can kind of feel these electric waves running from your, 
the base of your uh, your skull right down your spine. It's 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 really wild. I I love being around this stuff. <laughs> I guess I guess uh, I turned into a pyromaniac a little bit, and I think uh, a lot of firefighters actually are. You know, you're just fascinated by this stuff. But I I came to think of these uh, uh, forests on fire with flame as being consumed by the fire dragon. Um, and I, weirdly enough, I had a bunch of pictures that were shot at, you know, very high frame rates, you know, like, uh, um, uh, well, high frame rates, but also uh, fast shutter speeds of 4,000th or an 8,000th of a second. And you start seeing these shapes in the, in the shape of the flames where you go, hey, wait a minute. Doesn't that look like Chinese dragons? And I'm, I'm starting, I, I got to thinking, we'll never know what the answer is on this, but I got to thinking that maybe those ancient Chinese um, makers of symbols and artwork were somehow freeze framing the shape of flames in their heads in order to make the, the shapes of the mythic figures that they did. I mean, I'm making stuff up, what do I know? Here I am in the 21st century, speculating about what they did, but I thought it was curious that it looks so dragon-like. You know, in the center of this image, there's almost like a vortex of motion, like a, a, a mini tornado, which I've seen in eruptions that the air gets so superheated that you have all these mini spiraling uh, columns of fire. And that's what it looks like in the center of this image. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Down on the bottom right side there, right by the green, you can see that sort of cloud, that fog. That's actually the resins in the leaves are vaporizing. They haven't been hit by the flame yet. They haven't combusted. But the resins in the leaves are vaporizing, forming those clouds. And you can see them up there in the center. So you've got, you know, the living plants are still there and the, and the, uh, the vapors are going into gases and then everything else is going into flame. It's, it's an amazing moment. Yeah. Can I share what I feel when I see this image? Um, no. If you, um, I, I remember a, and I shared this with James, you know, when I saw the film Chasing Ice on Netflix and there's a, there's a time lapse of the giant iceberg that's receding and dying. And there's a song that I believe Scarlett Johansson has sung based on that iceberg. And I believe the song, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful music and a soundtrack. It's called Dying Before My Time or something like that. It's Dying Before, before My Time. time. Yeah. And it's an iceberg that should be living. And you have essentially humanized the iceberg, you know, in, in a way. And it's thanks to us is now dying prematurely. And I see the same thing happening here, which is the green leaves. You know, and then the leaves that were now are burnt to ashes are gone before their time. Thanks to the wildfires. So it's, I, I see a parallel between that. Mm. It's very, a very, very sad image to me when I look at it. Very sad. All right. Well, well stated, Paramal. Thanks for, the, for that. Uh, this was uh, a look in at one of the firefighters, a 19-year-old woman named Kerrigan from uh, Northern California. Um, and uh, you start to feel some of the angst of what it's like working on these fires when you see that face. This was at mm. the end of a long day up on a ridge in the, uh, outside the Carmel Valley in California, a uh, fire called the Sobranus Fire. It, it's a insanely hard work. Uh, I mean, the, the firefighters who are the, the line firefighters with the shovels and the Pulaski's in their hands, it is brutal work. Uh, and they, they don't get paid enough uh, for, for what they do and the service that they provide. Um, and I have infinite admiration for this kind of labor. Uh, I, I, had, uh, I had an interesting moment at a gas station uh, in Northern California after we were done at another fire. And we were all covered with soot and crud and we, we had all our Nomex on and we were kind of wasted and uh, pulled up at the gas pump and the, the guy pulled up next to us in regular civilian clothing. And he said, Ooh, look at you. I'm a firefighter from LA. Um, I fight structural fires. 
And I'll tell you what you guys do out there in the fires, you're crazy. I want to do that stuff at all. At least on structural fires, we have protective clothing. We have oxygen tanks. We do things in, in small bursts and phases. But you guys are out there basically undefended. Now, you know, I can't take credit for that because we weren't fighting the fires. We we're just at their, the shoulders of the firefighters. But uh, these guys, these women, men and women like Kerrigan, they really put their necks on the chopping block. And, and people often get killed and are very frequently injured working on these things. Mm, so inspiring. So pivoting, going from the eyes of Kerrigan to an eyes, the eyes of a Florida panther. Uh, this was uh, part of a series I did between 1988 and well into the 1990s doing studio portraits of endangered wildlife. And the premise of the series was that animals were going extinct um, because they were alienated from habitat in some fashion or another as a consequence of uh, human uh, interaction with the landscape. Um, but as time went on, I realized that there were other opportunities that these symbolic white backgrounds with strobe lights presented. And a key one was the opportunity to kind of get inside their brains uh, when, when pictures came together in a certain way. Uh, and I had actually for about a year been shooting this series, avoiding uh, looking into the eyes of the animals for fear of the pictures seeming too cloying or romantic or something or another. And in, on this particular set, this Florida panther, who was um, um, one of the very few members of the species left at the time, uh, perked up and gave me this look. And I realized I can't project anything as a person into that picture. That panther owns this picture by virtue of how he's controlling the interaction with those eyes. So just go with it and live with it. And that became the cover of a book called Survivors, A New Vision of Endangered Wildlife. And that was put out in uh, 1990. And by the way, all the pictures uh, uh, that we're, we're looking at tonight are in this new human element book. Uh, regardless of when they were shot, because the Human Element book is really a retrospective of all these bodies of work I've been doing for 40 years, looking at the interaction between Homo sapiens and the rest of the natural world. So this is one gigantic retrospective here, 325 pictures, 450 pages. And wow. may I jump in as well that, you know, your book, uh, this body of work came out in the 80s, late 80s, and it's been yeah. and it's been copied by several photographers since. You know the concept of white backgrounds and flash and all of that. So again, you're a trailblazer. You often don't get credit for that, but I acknowledge it because I, you know, I just pay attention to that. So well, thank you. And out I, there. I, I will candidly admit that at times the, uh, the uh, appropriation irritates me, but in the long arc of time and maturity, I, I'm grateful for the fact that uh, I've been able to inspire so many other people to, uh, to follow down these different pathways and let them kind of go off and do their, their own creativity. Uh, you know, that's how culture works. Uh, that's true. You know, Bach influenced Haydn and Haydn influenced Mozart and Mozart influenced uh, Beethoven and Beethoven influenced, you know, on and on. So um, that's, that's how it happens. That's, that's where the, the mojo comes from. Yep. None, of us, none of us, you know, think and hear and see uh, uh, only because of what we ourselves experience and do. We were, we're always building on what, became, what came before us. You know, that's funny that you say that because that's what I say when I'm teaching my classes, that that's exactly how cultures evolve, that, you know, I, I pour over books and magazines, I see a photo, and then I run with it, but with my own evolutionary, you know, take on the subject, but that's exactly right. And all the impressionist painters knew each other and were aware of what they were doing. Yeah, yeah. 
This is another uh, piece from the series. This was um, of a panda at a performance arena in Shanghai, China. Um, and this in a lot of ways uh, reflects the, what shall we call it? The surreality, the tragedy, the sadness of the endangered species story. Now, happily pandas, uh, because they are this incredibly charismatic uh, animal that China has chosen to celebrate as a national icon, uh, these things are, are, are relatively well protected. The populations have grown since I shot this picture in 1989. Um, but still, I think the, the vibe of this picture re remains that there's certain characters out there in the world that we, and from our mammalian perspective, um, pluck out of the whole natural system and hold them up to be characters that might entertain us, that might uh, make us emotional, that might make us agitated, whatever. And here's this panda whose um, existence was defined by performing in this arena in front of these crowds of people who normally occupy those seats up there. Uh, mm -hmm. Here's a portrait of that panda whose name was Weiwei, uh, by the way. Um, and uh, isolated in his uh, strange alien surroundings. Hmm. Yeah. But a beautiful he, picture. He does a, look, you know, I have, speaking of, go ahead. <laughs> I have a four by four foot print of this that was in the, uh, uh, it was one of the flagship pictures at a show at the International Center of Photography in New York. Uh, when the series came out in 1990. And that, that print is still in my, uh, in our family room in Boulder. And there's just something about this picture that I just never get tired of. I get tired of looking at most of my stuff over time, uh, but not this one. You know what it is? I think the very symmetricalness of the bear, look, or the panda looking straight at, despite the fact it's small in the frame, the connection between its face and the viewer is unbroken. And I think that's an unusual angle. I mean, obviously it's an unusual environment, but the fact that through that though, the panda looks like it's straight on looking right at you. And so there's that connection that uh, is unbroken, even though the bear or the panda is small in the frame. Uh, Paramal, you were uh, gonna make a comment. Yeah. Yeah, my feel when I look at this is, and I, I, you know, it is a, it is a, it is a very interesting image because when I look at the panda, it looks like a soft toy, and that's precisely what we've made the panda out to be. What the panda should be out in the wild, and here is an ent entertainment here, and that's what strikes me as an emotional, you know, response to the image. Is is that what we have done to animal species? Well, I think that's astute, and I think that's exactly James's point with that picture. Yeah, and, and, and you know, it's speaking about these points. Look, I'll be honest with you. I, I, I have these points and these ideas in my head when I'm thinking about a series or I get up in the morning before I'm, I have to do a, a picture. Um, but when all is said and done and you know suddenly i'm confronted with okay here's a panda here's the lights here's me here's my assistant what are we going to do you know how are we going to make a picture i basically strip away all the ideas all the rationalizations and i have to just deal with the visual circumstances and the technical circumstances that are in front of me and so what I was reacting to here was exactly all of these rectangular shapes, these tabs all across the top of the frame, the little tabs of all the seat backs. And then there's this magnificent red, car uh, red carpet. Um, and I've come all the way from the United States with this white background stuffed in a big duffel bag. And um, it was just kind of turn all of this weird, uncertain, a previously unknown terrain into a picture, you know, find the aesthetics in it. And it's like that every single day. And then after the fact, 
I can rationalize that the picture does X and Y and Z and we can have a conversation. But in the moment, it's about reacting to the, the visual and technical circumstances. Thank you. Very, very honest uh, of you to say that. Um, you know, I, I uh, shoot in all kinds of different formats, uh, ranging from 35 millimeter to medium format to back in the day, a lot of four by five. This picture happens to have been shot on a Holga, a $20 plastic camera. Um, and it was the, the series uh, with these orangutans was actually done uh, almost entirely straight out in the, in the, in the forest in Borneo with the Holga. And I was uh, happy to have the light leaks sneaking in around the edges of the frame. Um, sometimes they created this sort of, you know, the leaks create this sense of the picture is almost dissolving. And I kind of like that. And you never quite know how the a light leak on any given frame is going to affect the image. In this particular case, we took the story one further. I had shot a picture on an icon in conventional color and I projected it on a wall of the studio and then re-photographed the projected image with the Holga. And that's how this picture came about. Um, so can I ask you, so was it the light leak that was typical of this particular camera that you knew would be th that? I mean. No, no, it, there, there, there are places where the light would leak in on those Holgas, <clears throat> but it was different on every roll and almost every frame. It was never consistent. And sometimes some really good pictures got wrecked by light leaks in the wrong places. And then in other cases, the light leaks did something magical, the happy accidents. Uh, my, <clears throat> you know, I've, I've known a lot of uh, uh, artistic painters in my life and sculptors and uh, in that field, <clears throat> in those fields, which are not as technical as photography uh, is, people talk about happy accidents all the time. And I learned how to court happy accidents. And there's nothing that carries happy accidents um, more freely than, than working with a Holga. Okay. So you knew, I mean, that was my original question. You knew <laughs> going in that this camera can be compromised, but that was the challenge was to included in this important body of work for the serendipity of not knowing exactly if it's going to turn out great or suck. That's right. That's exactly right. That's a pretty ballsy uh, challenge to yourself, especially yep. going all the way down to Borneo. Jump out of the airplane with a, without a ripcord, you know, and see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> Glad you're alive. <laughs> Good. <clears throat> since since we're looking at people, this we were really pivoting now a lot. Uh, this was from one of the uh, the image series <clears throat> while uh, while we were doing the human element film, and I was um, looking at how people were impacted in a very direct medical sense by damaged air supply, by you know the, this this question of climate change. As is too often spoken of as an abstraction. We talk about it that it's this climate thing, that it's a whole bunch of weather events that happen, you know, all bundled up in one year and then they change in the next year and the year after. But on an hour to hour, day by day, week by week basis, climate change is about the crap that's going in the air. And so much of that stuff winds up in the lungs of individual human beings, like this 12 year old girl, Marilyn who um, has a profound problem with asthma that's triggered by tailpipe pollution, coal-fired power plant pollution, who knows what, uh, basic, you know, oil refinery pollution in Denver, you know, the stuff just swirls around in the air. And not everybody is reactive to it, but other people are. There's been a tremendous uptick in asthma uh, in recent years as a consequence of the pollution in the air. Um, and uh, Marilyn uh, has had dire, catastrophically scary trips to the emergency room repeatedly because of um, 
the asthma reactions that she's had to damage there. Um, so this was uh, a series that we did at a special hospital in Denver where the kids are in there. Um, well, the, the hospital has a special school within it. The kids can't go to regular schools because mm -hmm. they, they need medication so frequently all day long because they react to the pollution in the air that they have to be in this kind of contained clean room environment where they have a nurse available to give them medication four or five, six times a day during the classroom day. Their parents have given it to them before they leave house, the house in the morning. They take it again many times at night before they go to bed. That's how often they have to get the inhalers. And Maryland is one of those kids. Uh, this picture, by the way, is, uh, is done with a little bit of Photoshop uh, desaturation. I don't generally mess with pictures. You know, either I get them in black and white straight away on the film, uh, or I get them in pure natural color. Uh, and I don't do much color adjustment, you know, and very little really. I, I, I may look to make sure that the reproduction or the print is accurately representing my memory of what it should look like, but I don't generally do Photoshop doctoring. But in the case of this picture and the last one we're going to see, um, I liked the desaturation to give a sense of, I don't know, a, a little dystopian sense, a little bit of horror, a little bit of upset, a little bit of strangeness to the picture. Did you desaturate the overall image and retain the color of her eyes? Very good art. Okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Well, that's a good choice. I, um, I'm just gonna, for our audience, you know, I remember watching this particular segment in your film, The Human Element. As a reminder, you can watch it on Amazon Prime, Google Store, Microsoft Store, it's pay-per-view. But I, I was shocked to honestly see this particular segment. You know, this segment shook me the most, James. And the reason for that is, Yes, I follow a lot of news too, and you know, I'm plugged into photography and filmmaking and climate change. But even for me, it was a bit more distant as in something happening in the Himalayas or the Antarctic or the Arctic, you know. But this show, no, it's happening very much real. And I'm a father to a 14-year-old, so this really hit me home. And uh, it was very profound, very disturbing to see what actually kids are going through now, not, not three generations from now, but now. Yeah, now, and, and let me add something while we're on this. I know we're, it's already getting late in the show here, so I don't want to ramble too much, but um, I was diagnosed with a cancer uh, right after we got done shooting in the fires. And the cancer is of uh, the blood plasma uh, in my bones. And uh, I talked to a lot of uh, epidemiologists and oncologists about where does that cancer come from? And they said, well, the situation's indeterminate. We don't really know. We don't know where most cancers come from. Um, but um, we're thinking that it's connected in many cases with uh, wood smoke and the fumes that come out of the wood smoke and or the, and or the particulates which wow. made a lot of sense because there's never been any cancer in my family. I'm the first person to have it. And there it is. You know, we'll never know for sure, but there's strong circumstantial evidence. I will say that uh, though this has not been my favorite experience in life, I'm doing fine. I've, okay. I've acted perfectly to the medication. I'm in what's called stringent, complete remission. I have every expectation of a, a long and happy life. But uh, man, it was a blow. It was really a blow to come out of those fires and, and only uh, a very little while afterwards, bam, get this diagnosis. And wow. you know, I don't think that was coincidental. I think that was causative. Mm. Wow. Yeah. For the Good. sake of uh, us photographers, I'm very happy to hear the, that it's in remission or it's, you've got way more things to say with your photos in the future. Thank you. Thank you. I believe that, you know, James, my grandfather passed away with, can with, with cancer and the cause was environmental pollution. He used to work in a mill 30, 40 years of his life and all the fibers went in and he was healthy at 72, absolutely healthy. And in a month he was gone, you know, so I wow. believe it's absolutely yeah. devastating. Yeah. Wow. 
Uh, and on the medical side, this was from a series I did in the 90s called Techno Sapiens. You know, we're, our species is known as Homo sapiens. I took a little bit of poetic license and I was doing a series of portraits of humans with their technological, in their technological habitats or in their technological garments or costumes, whatever, that suggested that we were in some ways morphing into a new species. Uh, that idea has become uh, you know, common in science fiction and the big uh, special effects films, but uh, it's hard to put into still photographs the surreality of these things that are happening around us. Uh, this is a portrait of, a, of, a, of an electrical company lineman, a guy named Kenny, who had been working up on a, on a power pole and one of his work partners was supposed to have thrown a, a certain switch in a certain way and it wasn't done right. And it, uh, it cooked his arms, burned his arms right off. And uh, so he got this prosthetic arm and this, is, this prosthesis is the first thing that ever gave him a chance to feel heat and cold through that arm, uh, through, the, through the remainder of his arm after he, uh, he lost the rest of it. So there's, there's a long series of portraits in here, not, not all of it uh, about prosthetics by any means, but uh, this was maybe one of the signature pictures of the series. And was this prosthetic uh, just uh, made clear just to demonstrate what's going on? Typically they would be solid. So you're not looking at wires and batteries. Am I right about that or what? Yeah, you know, that's a good point, Art. Um, I, I don't know. We went down to this lab in Oklahoma City where this guy who was out there, uh, this prosthetic designer, who is on the cutting edge of uh, uh, this kind of uh, equipment. Uh, this is just what he showed us. And I, I suppose this was some kind of a demonstration model. I don't, honest to God, I don't remember anymore. That's 25 years ago, I guess. Wow. Yeah, go ahead, next. So moving on, uh, we're, um, we're looking at uh, this next little group. Uh, almost all the rest of the show here is from my extreme ice survey. Um, I've been a mountaineer since I was 18 years old. I've climbed mountains in the Andes and the Himalaya and Alaska and the Alps and all across the Western US. Uh, and I always thought, you know, there's a lot to do photographically with mountains. That's something other than um, beautiful imagery. And I love shooting beautiful pictures of mountains for sure. But uh, then I became aware, of course, that climate change was happening and I wanted to figure out, well, how do I photograph that? And I'll spare you a long story because we're almost out of time. But uh, I eventually, after a New Yorker assignment, a National Geographic assignment, I founded this project called the Extreme Ice Survey in 2007. Uh, some of those cameras are still out in the field right now but they are time-lapse cameras that are stationed by the termini of various glaciers from Antarctica uh, to the Arctic. Uh, we've had cameras by Mount Everest, uh, lots of cameras in Greenland, Iceland, Alaska. I do a lot of repeat photographic sequences in uh, Canada and uh, France and Switzerland and Austria. But in any case, watching the world change. Uh, this shows you a site in uh, South Central Alaska, Columbia Glacier, where at one point, as you can see, we had four uh, <clears throat> different cameras in these, uh, in, these, um, in these housings, clicking away every half hour or hour around the clock, as long as it was daylight, watching how the ice was changing. Uh, mm -hmm. And now after 14 years of this series, we've got 1.36 million frames in the can. Wow. Uh, uh, keeping an historical record of how these places have changed as we evolved through the Anthropocene. You know, this in some ways is maybe the best distillation of everything I've done to, <clears throat> to keep an historical record of the Anthropocene. You know, there it is, proof positive of what's happening in our time through all of those pictures. Uh, the, I, I gotta say the the logistics of what you just said is mind-boggling in my head. You know, uh, to plan all this, to get the funding, to go around, to get people to do it, to to document everything, to collect it, to sort it out. It's amazing. 
Yeah, and, and that's really what's, uh, you know, you get a taste of in the film Chasing Ice, the film that's on Netflix. Um, yeah, it was, sure, it was a conceptual challenge, but in a way, the idea was maybe the easiest part of it, the hardest part of it was organizing it, figuring out how to make these cameras work. You know, I'm, yeah, I'm not an, ele an electronics guy, but I had to learn a whole bunch of things I didn't know anything about to make these things work 365 days a year in environments where maybe it's 40 below zero, maybe the wind is blowing 150 miles an hour. You've got to learn all that. Then I have to fund it. Then I have to organize it. Then I have to you know, get the assistance trained to work with me out there. Then we have to go back over and over and over again to check on the cameras and collect the pictures and so on. It, it was a severe ordeal. It's still a bit of an ordeal, but most of the cameras have been uh, decommissions now, but uh, at this particular site, there's still cameras out there and we need to take them down next summer on the 15th year because, you know, after a certain point, you realize enough is enough. My life doesn't go on forever. <laughs> the money doesn't go on forever. We have to stop this. So um, anyway, I, I think it's a gigantic triumph to have almost a million and a half frames of the changing landscape through these cameras. And by the way, there were as many as 43 cameras out at one point. Uh, wow. I think that was 2008 or 2009. You know, I think it exemplifies that foresight that you had and I don't know that you know that I was involved in climbing for a long time as well and climbed on the Northeast Ridge of Mount Everest in the winter of 84. But even back then, when you're taking pictures in the moment, the concept of coming back and redocumenting the Seracs on the Rongbuck Glacier or whatever it may be, it doesn't even enter your mind or it certainly didn't enter my mind at that point. And yet you wish you had that foresight to document the receding of the glaciers because the hundred foot Seracs on the wrong butt glacier are long gone, but wouldn't it be cool to have documented that? And I think when you started this project, you had that foresight and yeah, the glaciers are receding at an alarming rate and you got, you got it, you got it on film, which suddenly makes the concept of climate change almost the debate of climate change irrelevant. It's yeah, there, you know, people are you know, accepting it. Back in the 70s and 80s, we just thought of glaciers as being these big static lumpy things that sat there, you know, the term glacial pace, nothing ever happens, right? It's like dead, right. nothing goes on. But uh, by the time the climate story really got, got going, um, it looked clear to me that if, you, if there was ever going to be a pictorial series that was going to reflect uh, how climate actually changes something in the world, that it was going to be with the ice. And it took me a solid two years in the field before I got the idea that became these, uh, these time-lapse cameras and this series and this project. Um, but it, it was in incremental process step by step to get there. Go ahead, uh, let's, let's show a, a picture pair of here, Paramel. Um, this next shot is from a glacier in Iceland called the Solomayoko. And this is in March of 2007. That's what the glacier looked like. Go ahead forward. Wow. And that was last year from exactly the same spot, the same camera. Oh my gosh down to the top of a, a, a big pinnacle, looking at that change. Why don't you go back so we can- Yeah, go back. back. Yeah. It's almost like you use two different lenses and perspectives, and yet it's the same. That's what's That's extraordinary. Yep, yep. That's history changing in front of your eyes right there. How many years was that, the difference? That would be 13 years. 13 years. But you know, you could, you, if, you, if you look through it in six month increments, which we sort of do in the book, you'd be shocked at how fast it can change just in three, four, five, six months, yeah. how, how much alteration there is. Um, and honestly, when I started this series, I thought it was a three year project. And I never dreamed that we'd see such pervasive change 
uh, such radical change. Uh, uh, literally, when we put those first 25 cameras out in March, in, in, well, March through the summer of 2007, I literally thought that, okay, maybe in three years, we'll see some change on a couple of glaciers. We were seeing glaciers changing almost immediately. Stunning, well, shocking. Well, and you're not alone. I mean, the scientists that this is their lives are shocked. They all underestimated the speed with which change is happening. Yeah. Now I wanna flick through these uh, next few pictures relatively quickly here too, next one. Um, again, I'm a, I'm a sucker for beautiful sculpture of ice and, uh, and water and light and cloud and all of that. This is a shot that happens to be uh, on the cover of the slipcase of the Human Elements book, uh, an iceberg in Greenland. Go ahead, please. Uh, <clears throat> now we're up on the surface of the Greenland ice sheet, looking down on the ice sheet. Uh, the whole span of that uh, shot is only about 15 or 18 inches wide left to right. And what we're seeing are, these are bubbles of fossilized ancient air. This is air that was trapped in the ice sheet approximately 12 to 15,000 years ago. And as the ice sheet is now melting, the bubbles of air are rising up out of the ice sheet. And in this particular moment, they're getting trapped on the inside of a very, very, very thin skin of ice that's just frozen across the top of this little meltwater pool so that you, you can see all the bubbles sitting there frozen. But that's fossilized air. You know, you've heard about wow. flies trapped in amber from the Jurassic. Well, this is, these are, this is fossilized air trapped in these bubbles in our current time as the ice sheet is melting. Wow. Uh, and extraordinarily beautifully photographed. Beautiful. Sometimes you're in the right place at the right time, <laughs> paying, paying attention in the right way. I've, Lord, I've wanted to go back out there so badly. You know, this picture just haunts me. I've got a 60 inch wide print of this thing. It, it's, it's actually in a show in Washington right now. I was just down there at the, uh, at the museum and, and I just was looking at that and, oh, it just, it's like a knife to my heart. I would go back there again and go chase more of these little pockets of air bubbles out there yeah. on the ice. But it's a, it's a big expensive production to be out there for a week or two camping. So next, um, Iceland. Um, I really wanted to try and bring alive some of these blocks of ice that, uh, were, that, that were breaking off this glacier. The glacier receded, the ice blocks went out to the sea and um, this was one night uh, in the winter in Iceland. <clears throat> and uh, it's commonly assumed that the moon is shining through that ice, which it was, but there happens to be an assistant in behind there pumping up the light a bit with a stroke. Uh, oh, yeah. so this, was, this was an amazing night. I, I had... Uh, I've been hobbling around out there uh, through the ice and the snow and the rocks with crutches because uh, I had had knee surgery three months before, re-injured the knee uh, when we were shooting. And, uh, and I was really upset with myself. I thought, damn it all, I'm, I haven't come over here, all the way over here with, uh, with a couple of assistants and at all this expense. And I'm, damn it, I'm not going home without a decent picture. So I pushed myself and uh, hobbled for a couple hours across the rocks in the snow and finally found this spot that was calling to me and that's the shot. Mm. You're an old war horse. <laughs> an old horse anyway. <laughs> it's a beautiful image. Last picture. <clears throat> um, again from the human element film shooting I needed to do something for that film. Uh, well, we needed, we needed to do something for the film that was about sea level rise. And my fellow uh, producer director were saying to me, you know, Jim, we've got to have you on camera somehow doing something with your still camera to bring the idea of sea level uh, rise alive. And I had been racking my brains for 10 years trying to figure out how you photograph sea level rise. And I had abandoned all hope. I just thought, it can't be done. 
because you know the ocean is rising on average about an eighth of an inch per year, and you know you can time lapse that to death, and you're never going to get a decent picture of it. But I thought, okay, guys, the only idea I have is I will go and I will try and do some portraits of children in the water with their parents in an area <clears throat> where the seas happen to be rising uh, uh, an unusual amount. And that's what we did. We went to Lower Chesapeake Bay in Virginia Beach, Virginia. And I organized through uh, an environmental uh, nature center kind of a thing, uh, about a dozen different models <clears throat> to come out with me in the water. And I just wanted to see what would happen. Uh, and the notion here was that when the children grow up, the sea levels that they're going to know will be radically different than the sea levels that we experience today. So I wanted to have that contrast of the generations and the age. And so um, on this particular evening, I was out there in my chest waders for about two hours shooting and my assistants off to the right. <clears throat> and these various models came and went and, and Vanessa and Trey came out and we photographed a number of different variations. And this one moment came along where he, he grabbed her back. She turned that way. The wind caught her braid in a certain way. The light was in the right place. I got one frame. The, the sequence moved on, but there it was. That was magic. Wow. Nice. Beautiful. It's beautiful. James, thank you. Well, that's the end. I, I do have a couple of questions I'd love to, to ask you and also to Art, and I'm going to stop sharing, but that was, that was fascinating. That was fascinating. Thank you again, James. Um, a question uh, from Facebook. How do you manage your emotions, James? Because you are clearly seeing a lot of uh, sadness. How do, you, how do you still inspire people? How do you inspire yourself to keep going? It's a strange business. Um, I, I will candidly admit, I've been writing about this in my journal this week. There's a certain amount of numbing that has to go on. You have to, be, uh, have to be willing to put yourself in a very internally disciplined state to say, you know, I've, whatever I might feel about this, I have to put that on a shelf because I've got a job I have to do right now. It's not for me to be emotionally agitated. Um, you know, pictures you haven't seen here in the series that are in the book are from the tsunami in Indonesia in 2004. I mean, that was horrific beyond imagination. You know, 175,000 people were dead on the coastline where I was shooting. There were bodies all over the place. It just was apocalyptic. Never seen anything like it. Uh, eight months later, I went to uh, Hurricane Katrina. And that's a tearjerker too, you know? Um, and specifically when I'm in those settings, I really, really have to hang on to my emotions. You know, if I stop and I pause, I feel like, oh, I'm getting tearful. I, 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 this is painful. I don't want to look at this. I don't want to deal with it. But you just have to kind of grab yourself by the throat and say, I'm not going there. I've got a job to get done. I've got to turn this thing into something inside that rectangle and move forward. Now, the bigger question is, how do you go on year after year after year thinking about these subjects, looking at these subjects, writing about these subjects, and maintain some sense of spirit and enthusiasm? And I'll tell you, it's hard. A lot of people in this climate activism field, uh, not just photographers, but many other people, uh, find themselves terribly worn out. I find myself worn out at times by this. It's frustrating. It's intensely, deeply frustrating that there's so much knowledge and yet so much stupidity at the same time in the socio-political reaction to all of this stuff. We know what the hell is going on. And the people of 20, 40, 60, 80, 100 years from now are going to look back at us and think we we're a bunch of criminals for not taking more action faster. And it's frustrating, it's painful, it makes me sad to carry that kind of knowledge. And yet I have to say, Jim, you're only going to live on this earth once. You've got to smile at other stuff sometimes and you've got to somehow carry that intensity in your head at the same time you have to take joy in you know, a sunrise or your granddaughter's face or your daughter's face or you know, whatever it is, whatever it is that brings you joy. 
And you've got to somehow hold those two things in the seesaw of your psyche. And it's a tough job. It would be a lot easier to just be Pollyanna-ish, roses and moonbeams all the time. But I, to me, that's not the world we're living in. I think that was a very eloquent and very clear and understandable answer. Thank you for that. One, one last question, James. I know we are out of time. What would be the best reward from people around the world, you know, for all the work that you and people like you do to fight the good fight? What would the, the one thing people could do or the two things people could do that would make a difference now? Since I'm speaking to a, an audience of like-minded uh, camera carrying folk, uh, I, I would just say that we have this incredibly powerful tool. This camera is not just a, um, an instrument. It's not just a, uh, a thing for creating pretty pictures. It's an incredibly um, powerful and influential weapon. Not a weapon, I hate to use that term. Uh, vehicle. It's a, let, let's call it a window. You know, as John Zarkowski did a zillion years ago, it's a, it's a, it's a, it gives us a window into the world. It forces us to see clearly. And I think it's incumbent upon everybody who has, has an interest in photography and is listening to the show to say, hey, I've got this fantastic thing that lets me bear witness, that lets me distill my experience, distill my vision down through that glass eye and in through that box you know, my brain is traveling out through that glass eye. And the world is coming back in through that glass eye to my brain. There's this reciprocity, this dialogue back and forth. Well, damn it, use that dialogue and say the right things, the important things uh, that can help tell a different story to the world and help lead to a better future. Uh, I, I heard an anthropologist speak some years ago, and she said, look, people like uh, that one of the distinguishing characteristics of the human race is that we seek patterns and we like to tell ourselves stories about those patterns. Well, guess what? Science is the, is the study of the patterns and art is the telling of the story about those patterns. So mm -hmm. here with the cameras, we've got a chance to say meaningful things. Wow. That's amazing. Those, those profound words. I want to just, you know, remind um, everyone watching now and replays later, three things. Chasing Ice, today on Netflix. Tomorrow, the film, you know, the human element. And then the book ASAP 2, weekend activity, buy the book, pre-order the book. You can get it on Amazon. I'm going to get mine too tonight. Uh, with that, I just want to thank you all and thanks Art. And then big, big thanks and warm hugs to you, James Bailout. Thank you so much. Thanks to all of you. It's been great fun. I appreciate it. All right. Thank you, James.